So uh, this talk is very roughly titled Mercurial and Friends. It's kind of a, a survey of version control, uh, then a, a focus on uh, sort of Mercurial, how it differs from some of the other options, and then at the end a look at uh, Mercurial extensions, how you write extensions, what you can do with ex extensions, that kind of thing. So by way of introducing myself, uh, I'm Augie Fackler. I work on Mercurial quite a bit. Uh, I work at Google on our open source hosting platform and doing Mercurial stuff there. To my knowledge, we have the only custom Mercurial storage layer other than the one that's in the open source product uh, for storing your revision data in Bigtable. And I've been working on Mercurial in some capacity or another for two or three years. I kind of lost track. So before I talk about Mercurial in particular, I think it's worthwhile to understand how we got to where we are in the version control space now. And as, as this says, this is a biased history of version control. Uh, I'm much too close to the topic to give you anything even remotely resembling an objective history. Uh, my friends have worked on almost all of the open source projects in one, one form or another. But it's also worth understanding what comes before to understand where we are and where we might end up going. So the, the oldest version control tools are just backup files. Your editor would save a file, usually end, ending with a tilde, every time you saved a file. But that's not really all that helpful when you're like me and you save every 15 seconds whether or not you need to, because now you can revert to the last broken version of your file rather than the last version of your file that had some meaning to you. And so the earliest you know, version control system, uh, in essence, was RCS, which is the revision control system which is unlike all the other tools that have followed in that it only can version a single file at a time and only text files. So you, you could RCS commit one file and if you needed to track another file that was essentially a completely disjoint RCS repository. CVS started as a simple layer over RCS. It doesn't have atomic commits because of that. So when, when I say an atomic commit I mean uh, uh, one, one commit is one entity, so you commit 20 files and those changes all succeed or fail as a group and then you can refer back to them as a given revision. So revision 20, you commit and your, your files are either revision 20 or n none of your changes make it through. With CVS you can actually start your commit of 20 files, then find out on file number 10 that you were out of date. So you've now committed nine files and now it aborts after you've already made some of the changes to the repository, which is not desirable because if you're adding new functions, maybe your unit tests commit before your new functions and now you just broke the build and you wouldn't have had that not happened. Because CVS is just a thin layer over RCS, uh, the networking support is also a bolt-on. Originally you had to have shell access to the machine where the CVS repository was and use CVS locally. Uh, the, the networking protocol called PServer is this uh, add-on and because it, that's an add-on, CVS is really slow over a network. It doesn't actually store a pristine copy of any of the files you're working on locally. So when you do like CVS diff, it's actually going and fetching a pristine copy of the file from the server so it can perform this diff. Tends to be fairly slow but it was state of the art at the time. In the early 2000s, Subversion was started as an open source project by CollabNet. And the, the goal of Subversion was simply stated to to write a compelling replacement for CVS. And in, in so doing, they wanted to have all the features I've listed here, you know, cheap copies so when you copied a file from foo to bar, you, the, the history could follow from bar back onto foo, but it also wasn't an expensive operation that used a lot of disk space and potentially a lot of time. They wanted to also track directories and doing that also meant that copying a directory became much cheaper. In CVS, when you renamed a file, you lost all of the history, or it looked like the file had always existed under the new name. So you could go into the guts of CVS and rename Foo's history to Bar's history. Then it looked like Foo never existed and it was always called Bar, which was also kludgy. Uh, Subversion also wanted to store deltas of everything. So when you check a binary file like an image or like a Photoshop document into a CVS repository, it actually stores the whole file every time. It's just like storing extra copies on your hard disk. Subversion actually stores deltas of these internally. It uses the same storage engine for everything, whether it's text or binary. They added atomic commits because you know, they're, they're starting from scratch 
it was an easy feature to bake in from the beginning. And they also added native networking because it was run as an open source project. It started as an open source project. Being able to work in a really distributed environment with you know, people in, there were some of them in Chicago, some of them in, I think, North Carolina. Uh, being able to talk over the internet and really do the development quickly was important. Because of that, it, store, it does some things that are uh, sort of uh, patches for the fact that the repository is central. Like it keeps a pristine copy of your local, of the remote source code so that diff is instantaneous and local. And the file system is abstracted. So the, the modular design means that there are actually multiple file system storage layers for subversion. The original one was Berkeley DB. Uh, the most popular one now is uh, called FSFS, which is just a, a series of files representing all the revisions. And at Google, we actually have one implemented on top of Bigtable. And it, it's worth pointing out that uh, ripping on subversion is very popular these days. But subversion and, and also CVS were both state of the art at one point in time. Uh, and subversion is not wholly replaceable with uh, DVCS as yet. So early distributed version control systems. Uh, ARC, short for archive, was kind of a contemporary of subversion, and it gets a lot of the basic fundamental ideas of distributed systems right, but it's really slow, and it didn't have its own native networking protocol, which also slowed it down. And it, its uh, command set is a little bit arcane. It never really gained any significant traction. BitKeeper is a proprietary distributed version control system, which is famous mostly for having been used by the Linux kernel. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about Git BitKeeper's particular internals or user interface because it's proprietary and I've never used it. Darks is a, a distributed revision control system, interesting both because it's written in Haskell and it's got a theory of patch algebra. So in, in most version control systems, your revision history is very structured. Revision one follows revision two follows revision, or revision two, one is succeeded by two, succeeded by three, succeeded by four. In darks, uh, if a patch will apply to the current state of the repository, you can just add that over the top. So if you've had um, uh, some, some exposure to linear algebra or quantum physics, you may be notion of the, the familiar with the notion of matrices transforming you from one coordinate space to another and the commutation of these matrices. You can sort of think about a patch as changing you from the space of one state of the source tree to the space of another sp state of the source tree. That's actually the theory Darks is based on. And this gives you certain interesting properties like you can check out arbitrary collections of patches and sort of mix and match features as you go. It also ends up not being as useful as you'd like because you can also check out these states of the trees that never existed before. So you could check out a state of the tree that seems semantically valid to darks, but actually has failing tests or won't even compile. It also uh, has weird slow corners where it gets into exponential algorithms where it's trying to explore whether or not different patches will apply and what the dependencies are between patches. But it also inspires some of the commands in later systems. And then monotone, is the most recognizably modern of these early systems. It's written in C++ and uses SQLite for its storage engine, which ends up not being as fast as, as you'd expect because of the, the seek patterns within a SQL database. And Monotone's unique feature was that they were really paranoid about history modification. There had been some hit, uh, hacking incidents in the past where black hats broke into a system and potentially corrupted a CVS tree or subversion tree by fiddling with the, the, the data in the repository and potentially putting malicious code in, in the tree. So Monotone uses content address storage for everything and then on top of that they crypto sign every commit. So you have your crypto certs for public key cryptography on your local machine and anytime you commit you're actually signing it with your identity. Which means you can't pretend to be me. This isn't a problem that centralized systems have because in a centralized system you're presenting your username and password to the server and then it's uh, performing that authentication for you. So I can't masquerade as you unless I have your password. But in a distributed system, my username is just whatever I've told the system my username is. So I could just as easily commit as any one of you by saying my username is Bob and now I'm committing as Bob. The, crypt the, the crypto signing prevents me from just pretending to be you unless I can convince somebody that my set of certificates are actually yours. This ends up being 
uh, very painful when you do want to go modify history. And that's something that is also a necessary evil. The most uh, prominent example of that that I can come up with is when AT&T sued uh, the University of California over the Berkeley so software distribution of Unix. And they had to go and actually expunge several source files from the source tree forever. And because they were using CVS, that was easy. They just went in and blew away the RCS artifacts and those files were gone. But if they'd been using Monotone, they would have had to get together all of the people that had worked on it and re-sign all of their change sets to have a valid repository. And that's really painful. So now we get to the birth of Mercurial and Git. Uh, the, the sort of historical context is the kernel hackers are using BitKeeper, which is proprietary. Uh, BitKeeper, as a sort of a pro promotional venture, m made it possible for open source projects to use BitKeeper as long as you stayed within the rules. And the rules included you can't reverse engineer BitKeeper, which is uh, superficially fair. Some of the kernel engineers didn't want to use BitKeeper because it was proprietary, and so they stayed with the old kernel source control approach of lots of tarballs and emailing patches. And when I say lots of tarballs and emailing patches, BitKeeper was the only version control system the kernel ever used because their workflow didn't fit with CVS or Subversion very well. There was a CVS mirror of BitKeeper, so you could sort of use CVS to at least get what was in BitKeeper. But one day, an enterprising kernel engineer uh, decided that he would just tell that to the BitKeeper server and type help and see what would happen. And much to his surprise, BitKeeper responded with its, its, a description of its wire protocol. It was a simple text-based uh, protocol and typing help was a valid command which returned the list of all valid commands. From there you can write your own BitKeeper client. The makers of BitKeeper decided that this constituted reverse engineering and pulled the license for the kernel community to use BitKeeper. And so now, You've got your army of kernel developers and you need a new distributed version control system and you need it now. Both of the, the systems developed, Mercurial and Git, take lessons from Monotone and as far as I'm aware from BitKeeper and just in terms of workflow. Mercurial and Git emerged within uh, two weeks of each other. Mercurial is written by Matt Makel who did a lot of uh, kernel development work. Now he's more focused on Mercurial itself rather than the kernel work. And Git was written by Linus. Uh, both of them sort of locked themselves in a room and just wrote a new system and released it. Uh, early Git was not really recognizable as modern Git, just in terms of the user interface. Uh, the plumbing is still very similar, but when it was initially released, uh, I believe Git was described as the con stupid content tracker from hell. It, uh, and it was explicitly described as not something you would use as a version control system unless you were crazy, but it was a toolkit for building a usable version control system. And whereas Mercurial early on has most of the commands of modern Mercurial. A few changes have taken place. For example, pull used to have an implied merge operation, which it doesn't anymore. But in general, early Mercurial looks at a user interface level more like modern Mercurial. The, the common goals of the two systems, which uh, in, inform their design in a lot of ways, they had to be really, really fast. And you, ha and you had to be able to work offline. So you, know, you can go to a coffee shop with no Wi-Fi and really focus on your work. There's no distractions. You can't get to Reddit or Hacker News. You can't see any new emails. And, the, and then the, th the third feature, which uh, is sort of obvious in hindsight because of monotone, was revisionist history should be obvious but possible. So Git and Mercurial both store their data using uh, SHA-1 hashes of the, the actual file data. And this bubbles all the way through by putting the SHA-1 of things you reference in, you know, your directory structure is just SHA-1s pointing to file names all the way down. So the revision identifiers are SHA-1s that transitively have include a cryptographic hash of everything in the repository state. So if the repository contents are modified, either you'll go and check the SHA-1 of your content and it's invalid, or your SHA-1s will change dramatically anytime anybody modifies your history. But it still has to be possible so that if you run into this case of, you know, I checked in some copyrighted content, we need to go and expunge it from the, from the history, we can go do that and then we can tell everybody, you know, these revisions are no longer valid, pull these new ones as replacements. And then we also obviously want efficient storage because we're using a distributed system. Everybody's going to be pull, pulling the copy of all of the history of all of the data everywhere. But the major divergence between these two systems is in their trade-offs. And that also informs how they, st they store data. Mercurial intentionally went for the goals of fast file level log and annotate. So if you do 
HG log foo, that should be a very fast operation, something, a question we can answer without much processing. And HG annotate, which gives, if you're not familiar with the annotate feature of a version control system, it gives you each of the lines in a source control file, or in, in a source file, and what re revision it was last changed, you can get the, the log message, the, who did it, and so on. So you can figure out, you know, what idiot wrote this code, oh wait, that was me. And predictable disk IO. So uh, Mercurial has a storage system that gives you order one access in terms of disk seeks to get to any revision of any file in the tree. There's Git, the major design goals were that changing history should be really fast so that you can you know, pull lots of snapshots of your history together and then roll them up in different ways. And commit should be instantaneous to the point of actually being faster than copying the files to some other location on your tree. Uh, the, the Git community is almost infamously uh, obsessed with speed. They have their own implementation of SHA-1 because it saves a little bit of execution time over linking with libopenSSL. So Mercurial's choices in particular mean that we identify file, file revisions with a secure hash, but we include ancestry in that hash. So if the same contents of a file appear more than once, it'll at least have two revision identifiers so that we can see what points in the history that existed. And storing this per file directed acyclic graph of history also means that some of the merge operations are a little easier to figure out whether or not we have a conflict. And then we also store deltas, deltas between versions as we write the, the commits. So when you commit, we compute the, the, what's changed between the last version and now right away Whereas in Git, that's something that it occurs later. And then all of the content is compressed with Zlib because on any reasonable modern CPU, Zlib is essentially free. And you, so because of that, when you first check in source code into a Mercurial repository, the repository generally takes up less space than the source code itself does. So the repository space hit is less than an, a full extra copy of your source code. The data structure Mercurial uses to show this is Revlog, and I apologize, this image is a little too small at your viewing distance. The uh, bl dark blue image is uh, the revision data itself, whereas the red is an index file. In certain cases, for space efficiency, the index file is merged with the data, but at, at a high level, this is what it looks like. You have this index, which has constant size records, and so you want revision seven out of a particular rev log. You can go read at an offset that's known in the index file this piece of metadata and it'll tell you go, go into your data file, seek to this point in the file and then just read forward. And when you just read forward, you'll get the base text for the revision you're checking out. In this example, the dark blue, the darkest blue revision is revision four and we're asking for revision seven. So you get revision four, the delta from four to five, the delta from five to six, and the delta from six to seven. And because we've performed that in one disk seek, that's a fairly quick operation, unless your hard drive is ho horribly fragmented, of course. And what you get when you apply those deltas is revision seven. And the deltas are cheaper to apply in memory than the appropriate seek operations to try and go find the data if it's scattered around your drive. This also makes the file format append only because we can write out the, the delta data and then the index data. And if something goes wrong during the commit, we just truncate the files to their old length and nothing's corrupt. So the rollback procedure is very easy and it's very quick. And the deltas are computed during the commit, which is in direct contrast with Git. The deltas are computed in an offline process. Early Git, you had to explicitly run this. Modern Git will run that for you. But what happens during a commit is Git compresses the, the, the file contents and stores it in the repository. Because they don't store per file ancestry, the SHA-1 of a file is really just the SHA-1 of that file's contents and with nothing else. So, when you do git add, it's going to compress the file, store it in the repository, but it doesn't deltify it. And then when you decide you need to talk to another git repository and exchange that data, or when you do this phase called git repack, it goes and slurps together all of the data in the repository, figures out what files are related, and then builds delta change that actually look very much like this, but have the interesting advantage that they can span multiple file locations. So there's a rev log per file in Mercurial, so you can't store a delta of file foo against file bar. But in Git, if you have 
the same file located at two pl places, that'll be stored as one, th one object in the repository. Or if foo and bar differ by only a few bytes, hopefully you, that'll be stored correctly such that one is stored as a delta of the other, even if they're different paths. In practice, Git does significantly better in pathological cases of renaming your source files around, but most of the time that doesn't seem to be a problem storage-wise, that the two systems are roughly equivalent in terms of uh, storage most of the time. And then to maintain this order one access to data property, this is something I, I forgot to mention, Mercurial will only write out as many deltas as twice the length of the original base text of the file. So if writing out revision seven to eight would take, would cause the delta chain to be longer than the snapshot, to, you know, twice the length of the snapshot, it'll write, a, write out a new snapshot. So you're never gonna be reading more than three times the length of the raw file. Sort of moving up a level from the Revlog storage layer, this is how Mercurial stores its data. There are file logs, which are the, the red uh, lines in the bottom, a manifest, which is uh, yellow or green, I've forgotten which color that is, and the, the change log, which is blue at the top. Each of these is a single Revlog file. The manifest is just a text-based format of this uh, SHA is uh, at this path, which th then those two pieces of information let you point into the red files. And then the, the change log has a pointer to a single manifest. And so the dark blue revision points to a specific manifest, which points to the dark red file nodes. And when, when you make a commit, if you modify the top file, the pointer in the manifest for that file advances through, through time. But the, the other file remains the same because its contents didn't change. So the change that points to the new manifest, which points to one new file, but the same version of the old file. And then the file logs, as an optimization for the fast log and annotate case I was talking about, actually have a back pointer to the change log node that introduced them, which gets recomputed when the, the nodes move between repositories. But what, what that means is that if I walk back through the red nodes of history, I can see which blue node introduced it and then show the log message from that change log node. The change logs also have some extra nifty features. Uh, in particular, they support arbitrary metadata. So you can store arbit arbitrary st string key value pairs, which we use for storing branch information or this originated as this change set in this other version control system. So you can sort of have the pointers back into the other system's history. Uh, Git is somewhat similar to this, but instead of a single manifest, they have what they call trees, and each tree is a single directory. So a tree can point to another tree if you have a deeply nested set of directories. Uh, and the, their, their change log is essentially the same. It points to a root tree, but it doesn't support arbitrary key value pairs. Instead, if you want key value pairs, the standard in, in Git is to use uh, RFC 822, I believe that's the RFC, uh, format headers, like mail headers or HTTP headers. Tags in Mercurial end up being a little bit odd uh, because of how we use Revlog. We're actually, we actually store them in an in-tree file called .hg tags. And the, the weird behavior is that there are two revisions in the history for any given tag. The tagging revision and the tagged revision. That is, if you make tag foo that points at revision dead beef, revision dead beef is revision foo, but there's this other revision for later in the history that creates that tag. So if you pull the, the revision history only up to the tag, the tag name actually disappears. Uh, that's uh, considered an acceptable trade-off in the Mercurial community because this means that tags do some, because tags do sometimes change, we can go back and be able to look at the history of a given tag and how it moved over time. Whereas the way Git handles tags is it, there's a signed object in the tree, essentially, which has its own SHA, which then points through to the real commit. And if the tag changes, uh, you can't tell what the tag used to point to. You can only tell that the tag did change. So you can tell the current state of the tag, but absent looking in some Git plumbing and, and the, the garbage collection phase not having completely occurred, you can't tell where the tag used to be. Uh, Git, Git has uh, an interesting different feature. They call them refs. Uh, we have an equivalent feature in Mercurial called bookmarks. 
in Git, because the repository is sort of an object soup, you have to have pointers into the revision history or the revisions disappear when you go to garbage collect them. So when you're committing against a revision in Git, you're almost always committing against one of these uh, refs unless you're doing something very unusual. And these are referred to as branches, but they're unlike Mercurial's branches in that they're a, a temporary name that you throw away when you're done with it. And bookmarks are the equivalent feature in Mercurial. They're, if you're familiar with Git refs, these are exactly like Git refs except when they're not, and you can just tune out until the next slide. The except when they're not is that uh, revisions don't disappear if they're not referenced by a bookmark. They're still permanent members of your revision history unless you go and explicitly blow them away. And this is leading into the extensions a little bit. These were added as an extension in Mercurial 1.3. So anybody with Mercurial 1.3 can play with bookmarks. We finally felt like we worked the bugs out in Mercurial 1.8, so we moved the features into core Mercurial and they're on by default for everybody. You can use them, you can share them, and so on. The way to think about a bookmark in Mercurial is essentially it's a lightweight tag, a disposable name for a revision, so that if you're working on 10 different features in your repository, you can have, you know, kill all uses of Hazatter as a name for a change set. And then when you commit to it, that name advances along with your work. So you don't have to refer to esoteric hashes. You can refer to actual useful human readable names. And before I talk about Mercurial extensions, it's worth talking about the drawbacks of distributed systems. In particular, uh, they're not yet a uh, no disadvantages replacement for subversion yet in that there's no good solution for really big files. So if somebody checks in a 500 meg file to your repository, you're stuck toting that thing around forever unless you want to go modify your history. Uh, this sounds like it's not that big of a deal, but there are a lot of development shops that actually like checking in, say, the installers for their development tools. So when you're a new developer, you sit down at your workstation for the first time, you just check out from, say, a Perforce depot and get all of the big files you need to make, do your install, perform your install, and then just check out the, what you're actually going to work on. Game shops also uh, feel this pain quite a bit because they want to version like the meshes for their game, or the, the, the models of things in the game, and those tend to be uh, hundreds of megabytes in size, like maps of, of regions or things. The GUI tools aren't always as good. So if you're working with say, less savvy users, uh, people not comfortable with the command line, the most common example is designers, although I know plenty of designers that use uh, distributed tools. Uh, you, they may be more comfortable with a DVCS, or a centralized system like Subversion. And there's a slightly higher barrier, barrier to entry just because there's more concepts flying around. There, in a centralized system, something's either committed or it's not. If it's committed, it's part of the central immutable history. In a distributed system, you can have all these local commits flying around, and then they're not really permanent until you push them, and sometimes not even until you push them to a central repository. And sometimes not even then, right? In a Git repository, it's not uncommon to have like a, a proposed patches branch, which changes all the time, because it's just the changes people might want to make, and there's sort of a request for comments on what you're doing. So with that, I'll go back to Mercurial, and th this is an, what I think is sort of Mercurial's coolest feature, is that we have the ability to have these extensions that do really, really unusual things to Mercurial itself. This is something you can't do as easily in Git because it's a bunch of shell tools that execute each other, and patching the behavior of those tools is uh, much trickier than patching a bunch of Python code. Mercurial itself is written in Python, so all of our extensions are just Python packages that add or modify features. The most common uses for this are to add custom features, but sometimes you also test new ideas. When I say add custom features, the solution to the big files problem that uh, I mentioned on the previous slide has been that a lot of small shops have come up with their own big files extension for Mercurial. So it detects when you're trying to check in, say, that 100 meg file and performs some other persistence operation on it. I, some of those have been implemented as commit back to subversion for a big file or implemented their own storage for large files on the server. A simple example of an extension is the fetch extension in Mercurial. This is shipped with Mercurial itself. It's intended as an example if you want to write your own extra commands. What fetch does in Mercurial is it runs pull and then merge right away. So in, in a confusing accident of history, in git fetch is a, a pull new stuff from the server but don't merge it, and pull is 
get the new content from the server and then merge it right away. In Mercurial, it's exactly the opposite. Pull is just pull, get, just get new content from the server. Fetch is get new content from the server and merge it if necessary. Uh, this is a great starting place if you want to write your own extension to customize Mercurial's behavior. An example of other extensions that we ship with Mercurial that are off by default, and I'll, I'll discuss why each of these is off by default in turn very quickly. Uh, the color extension does what you'd expect. Pager and progress both customize output. Progress actually hooks into the core of Mercurial to get progress feedback, so you get little progress bars. But that makes life difficult for people that are shelling out to the tool, like from your IDE. So that's off by default. The pager extension is kind of similar. If you're going to get more than a page of output, it'll execute more or less or whatever you're using. But off by default because it hurts scripting. Purge is a command that almost everybody uses but is really dangerous. Uh, in particular, it take, it, when you run HG purge, it deletes all the files that aren't tracked by the system and aren't explicitly ignored, which is useful if you've got a bunch of weird droppings around your working copy, but it's also really dangerous because there's no backups. It's like running RM on a whole bunch of stuff arbitrarily. And then these last three extensions are more complicated features that get added. Record is a ripoff of the, of the darks record command. It's an interactive commit. So it shows you each change you've made to your working copy in turn and interactively says, do you want to include this in the commit? And then when you've gone through all the changes or told it that you don't want to see any more, it prompts you for a commit message and then makes a new revision. So if you've done like three kind of unrelated things in your working copy, you don't have to have bad hygiene or perform a lot of manual tricks to split it into several different commits that are you know, one topic each. You just run record and start picking the little bits that you want. Rebase is the sort of famous rebase feature uh, made famous by Git, but Mercurial has it too. It's off by default because you're going and modifying your history. It's an operation you have to understand a little bit more about what you're doing in the model of a distributed system before you should be using it. M mutating your history is something that uh, can have unexpected consequences, so that's off by default. And then MQ is the, the most complicated extension that ships with Mercurial. It's uh, quilt. If you're familiar with the old quilt tool at all, basically you can layer patches on top of your repository and they're temporary patches, but they're also sort of revisions and you can, you can mutate them, add and remove them, you can share the patch trees with other people. It's an interesting way to share mutable history, but it's also kind of a Swiss Army chainsaw. You can do almost anything history mutation wise that you want with MQ, but it's also a really good way to saw off your arm if you're not careful. So it's off by default. But extensions aren't all shipping with Mercurial. The largest external extension that I'm aware of uh, is, is actually one of my own. It's HG Subversion. When I say it's large, it's uh, four and a half thousand lines of code according to SLOC count. And for perspective, Mercurial itself is 25,000 lines of code plus two, or 25,000 lines of Python and 2,000 lines of C. So when I say large, it's about the fifth, a fifth the size of Mercurial itself. And what it's doing is it's transparent subversion integration. When I say transparent, I mean you run HG clone on a subversion URL and that just magically works. It pulls down the subversion history, it turns into mercurial history, you can operate on it, you can commit, and then when you run HG push, it goes and talks to the subversion server and actually makes little subversion commits for each of your local mercurial commits. Uh, it doesn't ship with mercurial, but that provides some advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantages are when Mercurial's internals change, and this plays with Mercurial's internals quite a bit, sometimes the extension breaks and we have to go and fix it. The advantages are that we support Mercurial versions 1.3 through 1.8. Most of the bugs in this extension are not from the interactions with Mercurial, but the weird interactions between Mercurial and Subversion, the code of the extension itself, which is why it has so many tests. And because of that, because of decoupling it from Mercurial itself, that means that if you're on an Ubuntu LTS system, which is currently shipping with Mercurial 1.4, you can still get the latest version of HG Subversion if you've got something broken without having to upgrade all of Mercurial, which makes a lot of people more comfortable. And if you're trying to do some conversion thing and you need to hack on the extension, you're not hacking on the core of your version control system, you're hacking on this piece of software that's sitting in between them. So that all sounds really cool. What if you want to write your own extension? Uh, there are sort of four key points to how an extension inter gets set up by Mercurial. These first three are functions that are called during extension initialization. Uh, UI setup 
is used for modifying this UI state object that floats around. It contains all of the configuration information in Mercurial, so your username, uh, any like aliases for extra commands you have, settings for extensions themselves. And what this means is that as an extension, if you depend on some other extension being enabled, you can actually go just enable it. Or you can flip some little bit of configuration like the uh, keyword extension that provides expansion and uh, collapsing of keywords in your source code when you check out. Uh, installs a hook in Mercurial's hooks infrastructure in this phase. Ext setup is just like UI setup except it's guaranteed to happen after UI setup has happened for all extensions. So in HG Subversion's case, we want to do things to the rebase command, but only if rebase is enabled. Otherwise, we're not going to perform that initialization. So we have to wait until UI setup has been called on all the extensions so we know what extensions are enabled. Then in X setup, we look and say, oh, rebase is enabled, add our flag to rebase. Repo setup is used for modifying a repository object before commands operate on it. A good example of this is, in, again, HG subversion where you're going and running pull, we look and see, is the remote URL subversion? If it is, perform HG subversion's trickery instead of the standard wire protocol that subversion doesn't understand. Another example of that was when bookmarks was an extension, repo setup subclassed the repository object and patched in its own behaviors so that bookmarks would look enough like tags that Mercurial's plumbing would know what to do with them when you did, say, check out on a bookmark. That would just work. And the, the, the common idiom in repo setup is actually you subclass the repository by you know, doing repo dot under under class as your base class and then at the end of the method you actually assign to under under class to swap out the class at runtime. This is not something that you should commonly do but that's how this API works. And then command table is this dictionary of uh, uh, command entries. So you have the string of what the command is, so, you know, rebase, and a list of tuples that say what flags that command's going to take, where they should end up in the configuration dictionary. And then the, call, the Python callable that it's actually going to call when that command is invoked. And the, the last sort of extension trick it is the mercurial.extensions module has some really useful functionality if you're doing interesting things with your extensions. Wrap command lets you wrap an existing command out of some command table. And then you get, you know, the, the arguments that function normally gets plus the original version of the function itself. Wrap function is the same kind of thing, except instead of wrapping a command explicitly, you're wrapping some particular function. So you can wrap core bits of Mercurial's functionality. That's how the progress command works. It actually wraps the behavior of the UI object so that when the progress function on the UI object gets called, you actually get the progress wrapped version instead, which prints out a progress bar. And then the extensions, you know, mercurial.extensions.extensions returns the dictionary of extension name to extension module. So if you're trying to do something weird where you have one extension patching another, that's where you can go and get the actual module object for the extension. So uh, that's what I've got. If people have questions, I'm a little under time, but uh, start a little late, so. And you don't have to ask questions specifically about the things I covered. You're welcome to ask more general version control questions, too. So the question is, how do you convince designers that version control is a good idea? And the best way I've found is to show them that you, know, you can give them this way of saying, here's every version of this document I've ever made. And the ability to go back and look at all the historical versions of, say, a logo that they're designing ends up being really, really compelling, especially when you show them that I can get 100 versions of that logo in the same space that you're saving three. Right. It, it, you have to, it takes a little bit of convincing. You, you, they're generally going to be more comfortable with something like Tortoise SVN or Tortoise HG. But uh, once, you, once you convince them, it's like having a parachute, right? You're, you're so used to it that you wouldn't imagine doing any work without it. It's the same way you convince a software engineer, really. It's just it's more obvious because the tools are more mature for handling text files. Or 
And so the, the, the question is, uh, how do you convince, say, college students to not email each other copies of source files, but instead actually use the, the right tool for the job? And uh, the best answer I've found is to you know, be familiar with the tool yourself and then just start using it. And then they'll notice at some point that like, you're able to say, oh yeah, you know, Tom made this change and that's, you know, this is where the, the, the thing, you know, this feature broke. It, it's kind of like how do you get people to start doing unit testing? Well, you, you get them introduced to some problem where unit testing really saves their lives. Similarly, there, there, are, there are times when without version control I would have been completely sunk. I stored all of my Word documents in college in Subversion uh, because it was there, I knew how to use it, and it ended up saving me because I would delete some paragraph and then I would want it back. Right? How many times do these, comment these uh, emailed around files contain commented out code because, well, this might be useful. If it's in version control, you can just go and grab that if you ever need it, but then the file that you're actually looking at doesn't have all of this you know, cruft hanging around from a hundred different versions. It also makes it a lot easier to figure out who's actually got the authoritative version of something, right? Because now you can just ask the repository, hey, what, what's the current version of this file? And it'll tell you. Yeah. Is this running all on the server? Or is it, is it, is there also software? So there's, there's a lot of software. Um, all of them have some level of client software. The, the servers actually get progressively dumber as you go forward in time. Uh, Mercurial's servers and Git servers have less smarts than Subversion servers because Subversion servers are doing a lot of bookkeeping to help you keep track of working copies, whereas on the on the distributed system that all happens on the local machine. Uh, in, in, there are a lot of hosting environments around, so if you don't want to run your own server, right? There's there's uh, Google Code if you're doing open source. I work on that. Um, GitHub if you're using Git, Bitbucket if you're using Mercurial, uh, SourceForge offers open source hosting as well for a bunch of systems, including some I didn't even talk about. Um, if you're if you're in a, in a development shop, they're almost certainly going to have something like this already. And if they're not, they're jumping out of an airplane, jumping out of the airplane without a perfectly good parachute that's free. Um, so the question is, uh, will distributed version control systems or version control systems in general uh, sort of merge with like fuse file systems or become generally useful that way? So Subversion's uh, HTTP error protocol is actually WebDAV. You can actually mount a Subversion repository on any DAV compatible client and it'll just work. And when you save files, it'll make these auto versioning commits. I don't like that idea. I hope it won't catch on um, because commit messages are an email, like an email to your future self. Right, and I don't know about you, but my future self is kind of an idiot and can't remember anything that I did. Uh, so not, ha not having the ability to record why you're making a change and justify it do doesn't thrill me. It, it's really bad hygiene. Uh, you know, it, most distributed, you know, people that use distributed systems a lot have actually evolved a standard for commit messages where you basically have a one-line description that's enough that if you're really familiar with the project, that one-line description gives you a high-level overview of why a change was made. And then sometimes that's all, that's all there is if it's really simple. But other times there'll be like potentially more text than the actual patch itself justifying why the change is being made. You know, performance numbers or uh, a design discussion, some, some context out of an email thread. All sorts of stuff like that that is really valuable to have as a versioned artifact and explains why we got where we are in terms of your, our source code evolution. So, in, so uh, which option for large image files and binaries like that? Uh, for a distributed system or just in general? So in, in general, what I would do would be I would, I would recommend Subversion for that case right now. Subversion's still a perfectly uh, workable system uh, and it handles large files very, very gracefully because it's, it was designed from the, from the beginning to be very streamy by its designers. So it doesn't necessarily need to know how big a file is to operate on it. You can check in an arbitrarily large file and it's just going to work. Whereas uh, Git and Mercurial, you're going to be 
kind of on the, the leading edge uh, of what's going on. Mercurial has a, a, an extension called Big Files that's uh, supported, as far as I can tell, by a corporation that needed it. Um, and that seems to work very well for the people that have used it. I don't have any experience with it, and I'm not sure what the options are in uh, Git as well. It, it's a frustrating problem, and if it, you know, somebody comes up with a brilliant solution to it, I'm going to be excited about that. So uh, the question is, will Google Code add Git support, or are we standardizing on Mercurial? And uh, I have to give you the stock answer if we don't comment on potential product launches. Right? I'm not saying we are, I'm not saying we aren't. It's just what we have now is subversion of Mercurial. Anyone else? Or? I'll hang out a little bit if you want to play with Mercurial, learn how to use a version control system, you know, start using a parachute. Come find me. Thank you.